Chapter 13 July 24th This morning saw us wonderfully recruited in spirits and strength. Notwithstanding the perilous situation in which we were still placed, ignorant of our position, although certainly at a great distance from land, without more food than would last us for a fortnight even with great care, almost entirely without water, and floating about at the mercy of every wind and wave on the merest wreck in the world. Still, the infinitely more terrible distresses and dangers from which we had so lately and so providentially been delivered caused us to regard what we now endured as but little more than an ordinary evil, so strictly comparative as either good or ill. At sunrise we were preparing to renew our attempts at getting up from something from the storeroom, when, a smart shower coming on with some lightning, we turn our attention to the catching of water by means of the sheet we had used before for this purpose. We had no other means of collecting the rain than by holding the sheet spread out with one of the four chain plates in the middle of it. The water thus conducted to the center was drained through into our jug. We had nearly filled it in this manner, when a heavy squall coming on from the northward obliged us to desist, as the hulk began once more to roll so violently that we could no longer keep our feet. We now went forward, and lashing ourselves securely to the remnant of the windlass as before, awaited the event with far more calmness than could have been anticipated, or would have been imagined possible under the circumstances. At noon the wind had freshened into a two-reef breeze, and by night into a stiff gale, accompanied with a tremendously heavy swell. Experience having taught us, however, the best method of arranging our lashings, we weathered this dreary night in tolerable security. Although thoroughly drenched at almost every instant by the sea, and in momentary dread of being washed off, fortunately, the weather was so warm as to render the water rather grateful than otherwise. July 25th this morning the gale had diminished to a mere ten-knot breeze, and the sea had gone down with it so considerably that we were able to keep ourselves dry upon the deck. To our great grief, however, we found that two jars of our olives, as well as the whole of our ham, had been washed overboard, in spite of the careful manner in which they had been fastened. We determined not to kill the tortoise as yet, and contented ourselves for the present with a breakfast on a few of the olives, and a measure of water each, which latter we mixed half and half with wine, finding great relief and strength from the mixture, without the distressing intoxication which had ensued upon drinking the port. The sea was still too far rough for the removal of our efforts at getting up provisions from the storeroom. Several articles of no importance to us in our present situation floated up through the opening during the day, and were immediately washed overboard. We also now observed that the hulk lay more long than ever, so that we could not stand an instant without lashing ourselves. On this account we passed a gloomy and uncomfortable day. At noon the sun appeared to be nearly vertical, and we had no doubt that we had been driven down by the long succession of northward and northwesterly winds into the near vicinity of the equator. Toward evening we saw several sharks, and were somewhat alarmed by the audacious manner in which an enormously large one approached us. At one time, a lurch throwing the deck very far beneath the water, the monster actually swam in upon us, floundering for some moments just over the companion hatch, and striking Peters violently with his tail. A heavy sea at length hurled him overboard, much to our relief. In moderate weather we might have easily captured him. July 26. This morning the wind having greatly abated, and the sea not being very rough, we determined to renew our exertions in the storeroom. After a great deal of hard labor during the whole day, we found that nothing further was to be expected from this quarter, the partitions of the room having been stove during the night, and its contents swept into the hold. This discovery, as may be supposed, filled us with despair. July 27th. The sea nearly smooth with a light wind, and still from the northward and westward, the sun coming out hotly in the afternoon, we occupied ourselves in drying our clothes. 
found great relief from thirst and much comfort otherwise by bathing in the sea. And this, however, we were forced to use great caution, being afraid of sharks, several of which were seen swimming around the brig during the day. July 28th. Good weather still. The brig now began to lie along so alarmingly that we filled she would eventually roll bottom up. Prepared ourselves as well as we could for this emergency, lashing our tortoise, water jug, and two remaining jars of olives as far as possible to the windward, placing them outside the hull below the main chains. The sea very smooth all day, with little or no wind. July 29th. A continuance of the same weather. Augustus's wound arm began to evince symptoms of mortification. He complained of drowsiness and excessive thirst, but no acute pain. Nothing could be done for his relief beyond rubbing his wounds with a little of the vinegar from the olives, and from this no benefit seemed to be experienced. We did everything in our power for his comfort, and trebled his allowance of water. July 30th. An excessively hot day with no wind. An enormous shark kept close by the hulk during the whole of the forenoon. We made several unsuccessful attempts to capture him by means of a noose. Augustus much worse, and evidently sinking as much from want of proper nourishment as from the effects of his wounds. He constantly prayed to be relieved from his sufferings, wishing for nothing but death. This evening we ate the last of our olives and found the water in our jug so putrid that we could not swallow it at all without the addition of wine. Determined to kill our tortoise in the morning. July 31st. After a night of excessive anxiety and fatigue, owing to the position of the hulk, we set about killing and cutting up our tortoise. He proved to be much smaller than we had supposed, although in good condition, the whole meat about him not amounting to more than ten pounds. With a view of preserving a portion of this as long as possible, we cut it into fine pieces, and filled with them our three remaining olive jars and the wine bottle, all of which had been kept, pouring in afterward the vinegar from the olives. In this manner we put away three pounds of the tortoise, intending not to touch it until we had consumed the rest. We concluded to restrict ourselves to about four ounces of the meat per day. The whole would thus last us thirteen days. A brisk shower with severe thunder and lightning came on about dusk, but lasted so short a time that we only succeeded in catching about half a pint of water. The whole of this, by common consent, was given to Augustus, who now appeared to be in the last extremity. He drank the water from the sheet as we caught it, we holding it above him as he lay so as to let it run into his mouth. For we had now nothing left capable of holding water, unless we had chosen to empty out our wine from the carbore, or the stale water from the jug. Either of these expedients would have been resorted to had the shower lasted. The sufferer seemed to derive but little benefit from the drought. His arm was completely black from the wrist to the shoulder, and his feet were like ice. We expected every moment to see him breathe his last. He was frightfully emaciated, so much so that, Although he weighed a hundred and twenty-seven pounds upon his leaving Nantucket, he now did not weigh more than forty or fifty at the farthest. His eyes were sunk far in his head, being scarcely perceptible, and the skin of his cheeks hung so loosely as to prevent his masticating any food or even swallowing any liquid without great difficulty. August 1st. A continuance of the same calm weather, with an oppressively hot sun. Suffered exceedingly from thirst, the water in the jug being absolutely putrid and swarming with vermin. We contrived, nevertheless, to swallow a portion of it by mixing it with wine. Our thirst, however, was but little abated. We found more relief by bathing in the sea, but could not avail ourselves of this expedient except at long intervals, on account of the continual presence of sharks. We now saw clearly that Augustus could not be saved that he was evidently dying. We could do nothing to relieve his sufferings, which appeared to be great. About twelve o'clock he expired in strong convulsions, and without having spoken for several hours. His death filled us with the most gloomy forebodings, 
and had so great an effect upon our spirits that we sat motionless by the corpse during the whole day, and never addressed each other except in a whisper. It was not until some time after dark that we took courage to get up and throw the body overboard. It was then loathsome beyond expression, and so far decayed that, as Peters attempted to lift it, an entire leg came off in his grasp. As the mass of putrefaction slipped over the vessel's side into the water, the glare of phosphoric light with which it surrounded plainly discovered to us seven or eight large sharks, the clashing of whose horrible teeth, as their prey was torn to pieces among them, might have been heard at the distance of a mile. We shrunk within ourselves in the extremity of horror at the sound. August 2nd. The same fearfully calm and hot weather. The dawn found us in a state of pitiable dejection as well as bodily exhaustion. The water in the jug was now absolutely useless, being a thick gelatinous mass, nothing but frightful-looking worms mingled with slime. We threw it out and washed the jug well in the sea, afterward pouring a little vinegar in it from our bottles of pickled tortoise. Our thirst could now scarcely be endured, and we tried in vain to relieve it by wine, which seemed only to add fuel to the flame, and excited us to a high degree of intoxication. We afterward endeavored to relieve our sufferings by mixing the wine with sea water, but this instantly brought about the most violent retchings, so that we never again attempted it. During the whole day we anxiously sought an opportunity of bathing, but to no purpose for the hulk was now entirely besieged on all sides with sharks. No doubt the identical monsters who had devoured our poor companion on the evening before, and who were in momentary expectation of another similar feast. This circumstance occasioned us the most bitter regret, and filled us with the most depressing and melancholy forebodings. We had experienced indescribable relief in bathing, and to have this resource cut off in so frightful a manner was more than we could bear. Nor, indeed, were we altogether free from the apprehension of immediate danger, for the least slip or false movement would have thrown us at once within reach of those voracious fish, who frequently thrust themselves directly upon us, swimming up to leeward. No shouts or exertions on our part seemed to alarm them. Even when one of the largest was struck with an axe by Peters and much wounded, he persisted in his attempts to push in where we were. A cloud came up at dusk, but to our extreme anguish, passed over without discharging itself. It is quite impossible to conceive our sufferings from thirst at this period. We passed a sleepless night both on this account and through dread of the sharks. August 3rd no prospect of relief, and the brig lying still more and more along, so that now we could not maintain a footing upon deck at all. Busied ourselves in securing our wine and tortoise meat, so that we might not lose them in a, the event of our rolling over. Got out two stout spikes from the fore chains, and by means of the axe, drove them in the hull to windward within a couple feet of the water this not being very far from the keel, as we were nearly upon our beam ends. To these spikes we now lashed our provisions, as being more secure than their former position beneath the chains. Suffered great agony from thirst during the whole day, no chance of bathing on account of the sharks, which never left us for a moment, found it impossible to sleep. August 4th. A little before daybreak we perceived that the hulk was healing over and aroused ourselves to prevent being thrown off by the movement. At first the roll was slow and gradual, and we contrived to clamber over to windward very well, having taken the precaution to leave ropes hanging from the spikes we had driven in for the provision. But we had not calculated sufficiently upon the acceleration of the impetus, for presently the hill became too violent to allow of our keeping pace with it, and before either of us knew what was to happen, we found ourselves hurled furiously into the sea, and struggling several fathoms beneath the surface, with the huge hull immediately above us. In going under the water I had been obliged to let go of my hold upon the rope, and finding that I was completely beneath the vessel, and my strength nearly exhausted, I scarcely made a struggle for life, and resigned myself in a few seconds to die. 
But here again I was deceived, not having taken into consideration the natural rebound of the hull to windward, the whirl of the water upward, which the vessel occasioned in rolling partially back, brought me to the surface still more violently than I had been plunged beneath. Upon coming up I found myself about twenty yards from the hulk, as near as I could judge. She was lying keel up, rocking furiously from side to side, and the sea in all directions around was much agitated and full of strong whirlpools. I could see nothing of Peter's. An oil cask was floating within a few feet of me, and various other articles from the brig were scattered about. My principal terror was now on account of the sharks, which I knew to be in my vicinity. In order to deter these, if possible, from approaching me, I splashed the water vigorously with both hands and feet as I swam towards the hulk, creating a body of foam. I have no doubt that to this expedient, as simple as it was, I was indebted for my preservation, for the sea all round the brig, and just before her rolling over, was so crowded with these monsters that I must have been, and really was, in actual contact with some of them during my progress. By great good fortune, however, I reached the side of the vessel in safety, although so utterly weakened by the violent exertion I had used that I should never been able to get upon it but for the timely assistance of Peters, who now, to my great joy, made his appearance, having scrambled up to the keel from the opposite side of the hall, and threw me the end of a rope, one of those which had been attached to the spikes. Having barely escaped this danger, our attention was now directed to the dreadful imminency of another, that of absolute starvation. Our whole stock of provision had been swept overboard in spite of all our care in securing it, and seeing no longer the remotest possibility of obtaining more, we gave way both of us to despair, weeping aloud like children, and neither of us attempting to offer consolation to the other. Such weakness can scarcely be conceived, and to those who have never been similarly situated will, no doubt, appear unnatural. But it must be remembered that our intellects were so entirely disordered by the long course of privation and terror to which we had been subjected, that we could not justly be considered, at that period, in the light of rational beings. In subsequent perils, nearly as great, if not greater, I bore up with fortitude against all the evils of my situation. In Peter's, it will be seen, evinced a stoical philosophy, nearly as incredible as his present childlike supineness and imbecility. The mental condition made the difference. The overturning of the brig, even with the consequent loss of wine and turtle, would not, in fact, have rendered our situation more deplorable than before, except for the disappearance of the bedclothes by which we had been hitherto enabled to catch rainwater, and of the jug in which we had kept it when caught. For we found the whole bottom, from within two or three feet of the bins as far as the keel, together with the keel itself, thickly covered with large barnacles, which proved to be excellent and highly nutritious food. Thus, in two important respects, the accident we had so greatly dreaded proved to be a benefit rather than an injury. It had opened to us a supply of provisions, which we could not have exhausted, using it moderately, in a month, and it had greatly contributed to our comfort as regards position, we be in much more at ease and in infinitely less danger than before. The difficulty, however, of now obtaining water blinded us to all the benefits of the change in our condition. That we might be ready to avail ourselves, as far as possible, of any shower which might fall, we took off our shirts to make use of them as we had the sheets not hoping, of course, to get more in this way, even under the most favorable circumstances, than half a gill at a time. No signs of a cloud appeared during the day, and the agonies of our thirst were intolerable. At night, Peters obtained about an hour's disturbed sleep, but my intense sufferings would not permit me to close my eyes for a single moment. August 5th. Today a gentle breeze springing up carried us through a vast quantity of seaweed, among which we were so fortunate as to find eleven small crabs, which afforded us several delicious meals. Their shells being quite soft, we ate them entire, and found that they irritated our thirst far less than the barnacles. 
seeing no trace of sharks among the seaweed, we also ventured to bathe and remained in the water for four or five hours, during which we experienced a very sensible diminution of our thirst. We were greatly refreshed and spent the night somewhat more comfortably than before, both of us snatching a little sleep. August 6. This day we were blessed by a brisk and continual rain, lasting from about noon until after dark. Bitterly did we now regret the loss of our jug and carboy, for in spite of the little means we had of catching the water, we might have filled one if not both of them. As it was, we contrived to satisfy the cravings of thirst by suffering the shirts to become saturated, and then wringing them so as to let the grateful fluid trickle into our mouths. In this occupation we passed the entire day. August 7th Just at daybreak we both at the same instant descried a sail to the eastward, and evidently coming towards us. We hailed the glorious sight with a long, although feeble shout of rapture, and began instantly to make every signal in our power, by flaring the shirts in the air, leaping as high as our weak condition would permit, and even by hallowing with all the strength of our lungs, although the vessel could not have been less than fifteen miles distant. However, she still continued to near our hulk, and we felt that, if she but held her present course, she must eventually come so close as to perceive us. In about an hour after we first discovered her, we could clearly see the people on her decks. She was a long, low, and rakish-looking topsail schooner, with a black ball in her fore topsail, and had apparently a full crew. We now became alarmed, for we could hardly imagine it possible that she did not observe us, and we were apprehensive that she meant to leave us to perish as we were, an act of fiendish barbarity, which, however incredible it may appear, has been repeatedly perpetuated at sea, under circumstances very nearly similar, and by beings who were regarded as belonging to the human species. In this instance, however, by the mercy of God, we were destined to be most happily deceived. For, presently, we were aware of a sudden commotion on the deck of the stranger, who immediately afterward ran up a British flag, and hauling her wind, bore up directly upon us. In half an hour more we found ourselves in her cabin. She proved to be the Jane Guy of Liverpool, Captain Guy, bound on a sealing and trading voyage to the South Seas and Pacific.